I'm monitoring my other screen here. Hello. Hello and welcome. Sorry, I had my feedback going there. My name is Nancy Leifer and I am co-president of the League of Women Voters of Missoula. I welcome you all to this presentation, Next Steps on the Affordable Housing Continuum. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit, nonpartisan volunteer organization that supports citizen involvement in government. This evening's webinar is co-sponsored by Habitat for Humanity of Missoula whose mission is to build strength, stability, and self-reliance through shelter. The price of housing continues to be a serious problem in Missoula, compounded by the effects of COVID-19. Missoula County's housing market entered the pandemic with a rising housing cost and 2,400 unit housing shortage. Recent data indicate that Missoula had a 39% increase in home prices from August of 2020 to August of 2021. The median cost of renting or buying a home far exceeds the median renter and home buyer income. Both the city and Missoula County are taking steps to address the, challenging, the challenge of rising housing costs. The city of Missoula has created the first city government affordable housing trust fund in Montana. The county of Missoula has a draft plan that addresses affordable housing available for public comment now. The League of Women Voters and Habitat for Humanity are co-sponsoring this webinar to help the Missoula community more fully understand the steps that are being taken, as well as current information about the challenges of bringing down the construction costs for housing. To this end, I encourage all of you who are attending this webinar to type your questions and suggestions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will ask the panelists to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Our speakers tonight include Emily, Harris Shears, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Administrator of the City of Missoula, Jordan Lyons, the Housing Specialist for Missoula County, and Heather Harp, the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity. I will now turn this presentation over to our first panelist, Emily Harris Shears, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Administrator for the City of Missoula. Hi, good evening. I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see a PowerPoint or a slideshow? Great. Um, well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk a little bit about the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. As Nancy shared, I'm Emily Harris Shears. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and I'm the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Administrator for the City of Missoula. And I am going to share a little bit about the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which may be a review for some and new information for others. Um, and But first I wanna start where it all began <laughs> in 2019 with the comprehensive uh, housing policy called the Place to Call Home. And a Place to Call Home um, is a really important housing policy that guides our work that was created um, with community partnership and community organizations at the table um, to really talk about the needs of Missoula, uh, both current and then also for long term. And the recommendations are um, organized into four areas or strategies, um, including track and analyzing progress for continuous improvement, uh, aligning and leveraging existing funding resources to support housing, which is where the strategy of uh, um, creating an affordable housing trust fund comes in, reducing barriers to promote access to affordable homes, which includes incentivizing affordable housing development and supporting housing consumers, and then also um, creating infill, like uh, things like uh, accessory dwelling units and other thoughtful and um, gentle infill and then um, partnering to create and preserve affordable homes, which includes um, preserving what's existing, tracking uh, when periods of affordability are ending and supporting affordable rental development. <clears throat> so I'm gonna focus tonight on um, 
primarily on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, but I also wanted to just share a little bit about what's been accomplished in each of the four strategies since its adoption. I mean, these are some of the most recent accomplishments, but under the first priority of tracking and analyzing continuous improvement, um, we've completed the landscape assessment, which informs um, our allocation planning, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's a, a summary of local and population level data that helps tell the story and helps us understand what people's housing experiences and housing needs are in the city of Missoula. And then we've also created an internal tracking system to monitor properties that have expiring affordability so that we can be better positioned to uh, support preservation and acquisition of affordable properties that would otherwise potentially be purchased um, and then made into market rate uh, once their periods of affordability end. And then the second strategy of aligning and leveraging existing housing resources, we adopted the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in July of 2020. We seated that oversight committee, which I'll share in much greater detail. Um, and we also made our first award in uh, through a competitive round called the Innovation Round in August of 2021. And the first award was actually um, just approved last night at city council. Um, and then we also under partnering to create and preserve affordable homes, we've continued to use land banking as a strategy for high opportunity areas. And then we're also partnering with the Reed LLC developers for the Reed and the Rowe condominium development. Um, which is an upcoming project that will have both market rate and affordable units. And in exchange for a right of way vacation, the city brokered a deal for 20%, which is equivalent of eight units of that property to be affordable, um, restricted for sale at 120% of area median income. And that's a project that we are working closely with the developer and project managing when, until it's finished. And then um, under reducing barriers to new supply and promoting access, we're in our first phase of creating the voluntary incentives program. In the state of Missoula, we're not able to do a mandatory, mandatory incentives um, approach. It's legislated that we're not able to do that, but we are able to make incentives voluntary. And what that means is that we can offer developers um, things like uh, fee waivers or fee subsidization or subsidization of land um, or potentially things like a right of way vacation in exchange for uh, affordable units in their developments. And that's something that we're currently working with a, um, a uh, consultant to finalize some recommendations of our um, voluntary incentives approach. So I'm going to focus mostly on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I just want to give an overview. So in July of 2020, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund was adopted by Ordinance 3663, um, which means it's in our law and our statute that we have this Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And as Nancy mentioned, it was the first in the state of Montana. Now there are two. Helena also has one. Um, and the ordinance outlines the purpose of the trust fund, how it was established, what it can be used for, how it should be administered, and then also the oversight of that um, trust fund. And the oversight committee structure was amended to create um, a more holistic approach, including an additional community member, um, changing the name from Affordable Housing Citizen Oversight Committee to Resident Oversight Committee, just to be more inclusive of our full community. Um, and then also just some administrative changes, including um, the appointment um, timeline. Um, and that was amended in May of 2021. So just want to flag that there are some changes from the original ordinance, if you look in the amendment around per dominantly around the oversight committee. So um, this is a question I get asked a lot about um, 
how do you get money in the affordable housing trust fund and what's allowable what are allowable sources um, and of course we need money to create and preserve housing so it's a very important question um, and the ordinance does a great job of um, making a broad statement about what's allowable revenue including um, in the funding resolution it's outlined that there will be a minimum general fund allocation of $100,000 per year, that their um, revenue from the sale of city-owned land that's not otherwise earmarked or dedicated for something else can be utilized um, in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. In fact, we're waiting right now on the sale of the Scott Street parcel and that uh, revenue we're estimating around $2 million will come to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to be awarded for grants and loans for projects. We can also accept and um, pursue grants um, and then private donations, bequests and contributions. And then we will also add principal and interest payments from loans of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund back into the revenue um, and then fines and penalties that may be imposed from those loans or grants or loans um, and then uh, this is a great statement of um, other funds that may be identified as suitable. So really allows us to be creative and think about ways to capitalize this fund. The uh, funding resolution outlines a goal of having $10 million um, in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund within the first five years. And that's really a kind of a revolving amount of money. Once we hit that $10 million, the expectation is that we will um, likely award around $3 million per year so that we can have grants, we can have loans, excuse me, coming back in and kind of continue to generate that. It doesn't mean that we also won't um, continue to go after other sources of revenue. And then um, the other question I get asked a lot is what can you spend the money on? Um, and those are the allowable funding activities. So our primary project Areas are consumer housing services, um, new construction of homes, preservation of homes, and then our incentives program. Um, and eventually we'll include an accessory dwellings unit program that will allow us to partner directly with neighbors who want to um, be a part of a gentle infill strategy where we may will be subsidizing some level and cost of those in exchange for um, renting them at an affordable rate to people, but we're still in the development of that project, of that approach and program right now. So right now, um, outlined in the ordinance, um, there's a lot of activities that are allowable, including land for construction, preservation, uh, conversion or renovation of existing buildings to make them affordable, financing or infrastructure, um, acquiring and developing or doing construction on affordable housing, the upfront costs that are associated with permitting and development fees. Um, and that's where I was talking earlier about the ability to subsidize fees um, through like an incentives approach. And then also consumer housing services and then providing loan guarantees, gap financing. And then we also have the ability to take up to 8% of revenue generated in uh, the year for the administration of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, including salaries, projects with consultants, things like that. So I just wanna share what the balance of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is for fiscal year 2022. Um, and that is um, $3.4 million. And we estimate that we'll, we have planned to award $3.1 million for awards. And then our uh, available admin is um, $252,000. And our plan for that is that we will roll over unspent admin to years where we have a leaner revenue while we're building that $10 million um, base. Uh, and so that's why we are taking our full admin in this year so that we can roll it over into future years. And then I talked a little bit about the Affordable Housing Resident Oversight Committee and the structure of the ordinance. Um, and I just wanna share that this 12 member committee um, is composed of members of the community with backgrounds in community um, organizing and community work, neighbors, 
uh, people with backgrounds in banking and finance, housing and real estate, housing nonprofits. And then we also have um, three ex officio members, which are the mayor or their designee, the um, city council president or their designee, which in this case is council member Heidi West, um, and then the executive director of the Missoula Housing Authority or their designee, and that is Lori Davidson. And the meetings are open to the public. They're on Wednesdays, uh, the first, second Wednesday of the month from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and we invite you and welcome you to join us. Join them, I just staff it. <laughs> um, and then I just wanna highlight the work, the incredible work that the Oversight Committee has done in their uh, just short six months of being established. So they were, um, appointed in June and began meeting. In July, they adopted their own bylaws and then began the thorough review of the draft administrative policies that guide the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. In August, they approved the Innovation Funding Round Vision, which is that first funding round that I spoke of. Um, and then in October, they compiled and reviewed the landscape assessment which is that um, high level uh, oversight of the housing needs and experiences in Missoula based on local and population level data. And then every month they've been engaging in thoughtful discussions around equity and their impact and how they could affect policy. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about the project they're working on right now, which is the annual allocation plan, um, which is, Created and recommended by this oversight committee, it sets the high level priorities for the upcoming year. Essentially, they um, set budget priorities and then write a contingency plan to say if this, um, if no one applies for these main priorities, here's the other plan for how to use the, these funds. Um, it's informed by the landscape assessment and the public comment period for this will open on November 22nd which is Monday, um, it'll be open until the 30th and it will be on Engage Missoula. Um, and if I have time, I'll show you how to get there. Um, and then, and if not, I will make sure that the League of Women Voters gets the link to it and they can send it out to participants. Um, and then I just wanna talk a little bit about the plans process timeline. So they started drafting the plan last uh, meeting on November 10th. And then the public comment period, as I said, will be open Monday, the 22nd through the 30th. Um, and then in December, we'll be, they and I will be incorporating the community feedback that we received through that public comment period and finalizing it. And then on their meeting on December 8th, they will um, finalize and vote to, to recommend it to the mayor and the mayor makes the final approval for the allocation plan. And then in January, we'll incorporate the priorities and allocations into our, our application materials for our next funding round, which is um, going to open in February. And that's the unified application round, which will include our other federal sources of funding in the city. Oh, I did include it. So this is the homepage for a place to call home um, that you will be able to find the, um, allocation plan draft on, on Monday, and you'll be able to make comments there. Um, you'll find it in the news feed right here. Um, and you'll just go to engagemissoula.com uh, to find that. And then I'll also, we'll send it out as well in news alerts. So I'll share that with the league as well. So um, I'm all done with the overview, but I just wanna encourage people to connect with us, reach out, share ideas, ask questions. Um, and I can be reached at, by email or phone. Thank you, Emily, for that great overview of, of what's happening with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Our next speaker this evening is Jordan Lyons, who is the housing specialist for Missoula County. Jordan will be explaining the housing components of Missoula County's draft plan called Breaking Ground. Take it away, Jordan. Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thanks, Emily, great presentation. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Jordan Lyons. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the housing specialist in Missoula County. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to share tonight an update on our draft housing action plan, Breaking Ground. Um, so, um, we, uh, there's a draft of the plan available now um, uh, on our website, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that and how, how we came up with this plan and kind of some of the conditions we found. Um, so our plan is based on community input. So um, we're not looking for like a top-down solution to um, the complex issue of uh, housing affordability in Missoula County. Um, this, this housing action plan is based on input from our community. So we asked questions about housing to the public on our community needs assessment, and we had 887 responses. We put together a steering committee to oversee the plan that included um, private developers, nonprofits, um, leaders from communities all over Missoula County. Um, as we know, Missoula County is a very large county geographically that's full of many different communities. So um, it was really important to have a, um, a diverse group of stakeholders for that steering committee. And then also we, we engaged a lot of stakeholders one-on-one. -on -one. So um, we met with different folks who have different roles in housing in Missoula County and live in different communities. Um, and additionally, we, we also were really fortunate that, you know, that the city of Missoula does have the place to call home policy and we're able to, um, you know, study that, um, build on that, come up with something that complements it. Um, and then we're also really fortunate to have really great resources in Missoula, like um, great data from the Missoula Organization of Realtors. Um, and so looking at all that data um, and, um, you know, just really assessing things that are going on based on those interactions with stakeholders, um, we had some findings about the housing conditions here in Missoula County. Um, and so just like Nancy mentioned, um, Missoula County has a shortage of about 2,400 um, housing units. So um, we just don't have as many units as we should have um, to have, based on the number of households in the county, to have an efficient, affordable um, housing stock. And so that, that supply issue is kind of the upstream issue that causes all these different housing issues that we see. So, um, you know, the high prices for homes for sale, um, high rental amounts, and um, you know high cost for rentals and low vacancies in the rental market. Um, so those are the you know that's the big the context the housing shortage and then um, also we found that um, on, you know left on its own the the housing market will not produce enough units to meet demand in the near term. So it's not um, we can't just you know take our hands off and let the market figure it out. Um, that's not going to get us to um, closing the gap. Um, and if you if you happen to take a look at the plan, um, you know most most of most people skip right ahead to the recommendations, which is which is just fine. Um, but there's some really great tools in there for really thinking in the big picture about housing. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look at the section of the plan called the framework for action. And um, one one model that that kind of talks about is that. Um, there are really kind of two housing issues going on that are interrelated. Um, and this chart kind of shows that. So um, this line with the circles up and down the middle is kind of a distribution of incomes, right? So you have very hot people with really high incomes or high amounts of assets in the luxury market. And then way down at the bottom, you have people with extremely low incomes. Um, and we have kind of two environments, each with its own issue going on. So in the market environment, um, we have that supply shortage and um, we have in-migration to Missoula County. And so prices there, um, in a normal housing market, um, prices will tend to filter down. A, you know, um, a brand new housing unit um, might be a luxury unit that will maybe kind of depreciate over time and filter down a little bit. Um, and that's how you can get some kind of naturally occurring affordability. Um, but what we have here in Missoula right now in Missoula County is um, we have um, prices growing faster than those units can filter down. And so um, overall affordability is getting worse. 
And then, um, so we have that situation. And then in the supported environment, um, folks, you know, in the last few decades in the United States, um, folks who are on the lower end of the income spectrum um, depend on um, housing subsidies. So, you know, um, whether it's vouchers or um, living in a low income housing tax credit property or public housing. Um, and what, what happens is that, um, you know, there, there just aren't enough of those supports to go around for everybody who needs them. And there is some overlap in those. Um, and the other thing is, you know, with the homes in the market environment being so expensive, that overlap is very narrow. And that's where we kind of see issues like you, you may have seen in the media that, you know, people get a, a housing choice voucher and then they can't find a rental that will accept it that they can afford. Um, or people, you know, have a hard time using um, down payment assistance to, you know, because that's funded by home and that, that says you can only buy a home that costs, you know, this much and there just aren't any homes on the market or they get snatched up with cash offers very quickly. Um, so that's kind of the big picture, um, a chart that shows kind of what, what some of these moving pieces and parts are in our housing market. Um, that are causing all these problems for us. Um, and, you know, another one I like to show that's also in that framework for action are um, the types of strategies that Missoula County can use to support housing production. So, you know, Missoula County, um, we have we have kind of unique powers and constraints. Um, and so this kind of is a look at, there are a lot of different um, options, things we can do to, um, to move the needle on housing affordability. And if you look here, um, there's this air, these there are arrows at the bottom. These kind of go from the least impactful all the way to the most impactful. So, you know, some of the least impactful are gonna be things like producing informational resources. And the most impactful on the other end are acquiring and allocating funding and land acquisition and disposition. So actually, you know, providing money or land to develop affordable properties. Um, those are also, I think this correlates really closely also to um, those ones on the left are a lot less resource intensive. The ones on the right are gonna take a lot more time and money um, and other resources to, to affect. Um, and so kind of given, given those circumstances, given that framework, um, our plan sets some goals around housing. And um, the first goal is to use the county's toolkit to increase housing supply. So, you know, similar to that chart we just looked at, Missoula County has unique resources and authority um, to change this situation. And so we have tools at our disposal, like uh, zoning, we can plan for and invest in infrastructure and, um, Another option would be we could use county lands to um, actually develop affordable housing. Um, the second goal is providing more funding for programs to help people access and stay in stable housing. Um, and I think, you know, that's really an acknowledgement that um, when, when we have poor housing affordability, that does not impact everyone in the county equally. Um, it has a much more serious impact on, um, on people with low to moderate incomes. And we need to really support those folks and um, help them access housing, afford it and stay in it. Um, and then um, the, third, uh, the third goal that we set is, um, you know, acknowledging that we do have those powers, but Missoula County can't do it all on our own um, to effectively address this issue. Um, we need to partner with the city with, um, and with other jurisdictions, with housing nonprofits, and um, with developers and other stakeholders to improve um, the policies that we have to deal with from the state and federal government. You know, Emily in her presentation mentioned, um, you know, there are some things that even just recently the state government kind of took off the table, took out of our toolkit. So um, we need to really advocate to um, make sure that we have as many tools as we can to, um, to improve this situation. Um, and 
The I wanted to I usually just like to highlight um, a couple of the recommendations. There are about 22 of them in the plan. Um, and I know tonight we kind of had a focus on um, Jedi, the ancient order of light side force superheroes. Um, no, I, but Jedi, you know, in the city and the county, when we're talking about Jedi, right, we're talking about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I know that um, our equity coordinator, um, Jamar Galbraith, is a big um, sci-fi enthusiast, and he just, he loves that, he loves that, um, that, that pun or that plan words. Um, so I just wanted to like kind of lift up um, some of the recommendations that I think are most related to that. Um, and I think a lot of those live in that goal too, um, supporting folks with low to moderate incomes. So um, we wanna develop a program that provides down payment assistance and supports access to home ownership. Um, we're really interested in helping folks who are um, first time home buyers. And I know on the County Commission, there's a lot of appetite for helping people who are first generation home buyers, um, folks who, you know, their parents may not have owned a home and they haven't been able to access that kind of um, ladder to that, that generational wealth. Um, other, other recommendations were to rehab homes of low to moderate income residents, um, expanding programs for low income renters, um, Ha, uh, making sure that we have a strong right of first refusal and deed restrictions for county supported housing projects to ensure long term affordability. Um, and, you know, that's, um, you know, we want to make sure that when we are using resources that we're, we're um, being good stewards of those and we're, we're supporting projects that are going to be affordable for the long haul. And then um, another one is um, identifying and clarifying the county's role and services for people who are experiencing homelessness or houselessness. Um, so those that's a kind of a snapshot. I think they all kind of touch on, um, you know, whether you want to call it Jedi or diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about that um, as the evening, as the evening goes on. Um, so our next steps, uh, we are pursuing the adoption of this issue plan as an issue plan in the county growth policy. So it'll actually be attached to the growth policy. It'll inform um, planning decisions um, in the next draft of the, of the growth policy. Um, so we right now are we're collecting feedback from the, the public. Uh, we'll, we're incorporating that into the next draft. So there's a draft on the website now. Um, there'll be a new draft that is what the planning board actually reviews, and that'll be out on November 26th. Um, that planning board, they'll have their public hearing about it, um, about the plan and the, the comments on it, um, and decide whether to recommend it on December 7th. And then we plan on the Board of County Commissioners um, um, considering it for adoption on um, January 13th at their public meeting. Um, so, there are still plenty of ways to participate. Um, we had a questionnaire um, and the results of that will be available shortly. Um, you can read the draft that the questionnaire was based on on, on our website, uh, http colon slash slash missoula.co slash housing. Um, and then there'll be that new draft available on November 26th and you can provide a public comment on that also. Um, when you're done commenting on the affordable housing trust funds, allocation plan, you can comment on um, on our draft housing action plan. And um, if you have questions or you'd like to give a comment in um, not through the website, you can sure do that too. You can email me at jlyons at missoulacounty.us um, or give me a call at 406-258-3444. And um, I have questions and comments, but I'm sure we will get to those um, after after Heather gets a chance to present it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jordan, for helping us understand more about Missoula County's efforts to address the cost of housing. Our third speaker this evening is Heather Harp. Heather is the Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity. Habitat is actively involved in building homes intended to be affordable for lower income Missoulians. Habitat's recent experience in building homes highlights the challenges and some potential solutions to bring down the cost of constructing homes in Missoula. So take it away, Heather. 
Great. Thank you so very much. Uh, it's really just a wonderful um, opportunity to be at the same table, not just with uh, Nancy Leifer of the League of Women Voters, who I've known now for a number of years, but also Jordan and Emily um, from the county and the city. For those who don't know, I also serve on city council, and I think I have just six weeks remaining in my one and only term. But that opportunity really has been a, an extraordinary time. Uh, it's allowed me to really look at housing through two lenses simultaneously. And that one is up at the 30,000 foot level where we get to talk the talk. And here at Habitat, I get to walk the walk. And um, being able to do both simultaneously um, on my way out of council is truly been a, a, a remarkable gift. And um, I, I, I really take great I take it as a great honor to be serving the city of Missoula as well as our constituents here at Habitat. So let me share my screen with all of you. And everybody see that okay? All right, we got a thumbs up, perfect. All right, so tonight when I wanted to just kind of give a little outline of what Habitat has been doing, but also more importantly, where we're headed. And I think first off, I want to just kind of talk about who our clientele really kind of focus on. And we really have focused on 40 to 80% of area median income. And Jordan had that really wonderful slide that talked about supported environment versus the market environment. So we are 100% in that supported environment. And largely over the last 30 years, we have been supported through donation of labor. We have roughly 3,000 volunteers, or sorry, 300 volunteers every year, give or take, um, who donate in the in the realm of 10 to 15,000 hours per year on our homes. And so, when we equate that to what a what the average and hourly rate is for for someone in construction, that works out to be roughly $100,000 per home. So when we build homes, we have predominantly been able to do that for this segment of our population because of the volunteers that show up on our job site each and every day. Okay, so those people include people like carpenters who make 25 bucks an hour, forklift operators that are around 18, down to personal care attendants who are making roughly, um, oh, sorry, uh, 16 bucks an hour. So it, it's it's working class people. We we talk about this all the time in our in our society, but I just want to put like an occupation, if you will, to the folks that we are helping. So on this particular side, you can find um, any one of these particular professions. Next slide talks about where. Um, let's see if we can make this go. There we go. Um, if my carpenter, who's making $25 an hour, had a $500 down payment, which I know is unusual, but that's how our model works, and we can offer a loan at 2% or less, usually free, and if their credit rating is at the medium level, they don't have to be a high credit risk, but just a, a, a decent, and if they had home insurance of $80 a month, or a home association fee of $40 a month, had to pay annual property taxes of 1.2% of the home value each year, which is just like everybody else. And then the unicorn is if they had $0 in debt each and every month. I have yet to find one of those, but if, we, if they were in existence, what could they afford in terms of a home today? And I'm gonna warn y'all, this next slide gets a little busy, so hang tight with me. So this is a slide of 40 to 80% of AMI. In pink on the left is 40%, in yellow in the middle is 80%, and on the right in pink is 100%. So my carpenter, remember, is earning $25 an hour. So in the middle section, in the yellow, we can see that an hourly rate is somewhere, as if, if that carpenter was a, um, a family of two, um, at $25 an hour, the maximum value that they could be able to afford based on um, their circumstances is $202,000.
If they happen to have a family of three, then it goes up to 242,000, okay? So that's what that family size can afford. And I know it gets a little wonky based on family size, but those are the confines in which we operate. So I've just pulled up a little, little bubble here where it says habitat of a house of 200,000. That is predominantly what we've been able to give our, our mortgages at for the last number of years. So we, we're able, because of all that volunteer labor I mentioned before, be able to have someone who earns 80% uh, for a family of one can afford one of our homes. However, what we're facing is a big increase and this is land costs, right? So back in 1991, when we first started, we got lots for $8,000 a piece. Today, people call me up and say, hey, I got a house for sale or a lot for sale. And I ask, well, what is it? What, what's the cost? It's $150,000 for that lot. So I have to add that on top of the cost of the construction. And then finally, um, I throw up one more bubble up here, and this is my, my colleague who's an infill developer over at Continuum. He can do the same kind of home, but it's going to cost $500,000 because he's got to add in the labor, and he's also got to make sure he has a little profit margin because, believe it or not, this game is pretty risky, and he's got to make sure he has enough to go on to the next project. Here, I just wanted to show you a table of what the average square foot of our homes are, which is around 1,400 square feet. And if we kind of just see year by year, the Habitat home of 2019 versus 21 versus Continuum's price, those labor costs, the lumber costs, and the lots and laws all kind of combined equal 200,000, 350, and 500,000. So folks, I, I, I bring this up because right now, we are on the cusp. Habitat is right on the cusp of not being able to deliver product to our clientele, our workforce, because of the cost has gone up so much. So either we can, you know, complain about it or we can do something about it. And I'm in that camp of trying to do something about it. And I can't do it alone. It's people like Emily and Jordan who work in their particular agencies who are also very much committed to making sure that we make more housing happen. So it is very much a collaboration across sectors, across agencies, because this matters. Businesses we know can't seem to be able to hire people and in large part because there isn't housing for those new employees to come online. So what are people actually looking for? Now, I, I will be the first to admit, Habitat has always focused on single family housing. And we've typically, in the, over the decades, focused on families. And when we think of families, we think of nuclear families, mom and dad and two kids. Well, what was really interesting in one of my conversations, I learned from AARP, um, that the demographic of households has really shifted. So this is a little busy, so hang with me here, but um, we have a single, what we've seen is that that nuclear household used to be 40% of all households back when I was a kid, back in the 70s. And what we've seen just due to how, how life happens is that now nuclear families are only 20% of all households. And meanwhile, single person households has gone from 15% and risen to 28%. And now they are the largest demographic of households out there. But unfortunately, we as builders have not been keeping up with that transition. We keep building three, four, five bedroom homes for households of one or two. And so we are building the wrong product and we are mismatching that product to the household. And this is something I think we, we collectively really have to address. The problem is, is that there's more money to be made in those single family homes than in a condo or in a town home. And that's also been kind of a real um, contributing factor to higher home prices. So I'm gonna just give you a little education as we go along here, I hope. So there are five L's that I believe are the elements in the calculus of housing. And I stole this from the National Association of Home Builders. 
it's easy to remember. And so make sure you share this with people uh, that you are talking to tomorrow so that uh, it stays fresh in your minds. And those five are labor, lumber, lending, lots, and laws. The first two, labor and lumber, how Habitat is addressing it. We stood up a innovation team uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, we have a labor shortage, to say the least, as well as skyrocketing lumber prices. Um, materials across the board just are a lot more expensive than they were um, two years ago. And we know that supply chain across the world have been completely disrupted, and that's been a large contributing factor as well. So the innovation team in particular is really tasked with thinking outside of our stick built box. And stick built is another way of saying wood framed houses, but it's the most traditional way that we've always built houses because we are surrounded by a lot of timber and it's been very, uh, it's, well, it's easy to transport and therefore, and it's also um, easy to, to build. So here we have stick built. Um, this year, we stood up an ICF house next to um, the stick built house that we're building. An ICF is insulated concrete forms, which are basically big styrofoam Legos that you stack up into walls and you can be five years old and do it. I've seen it done as well as 80 year old, 80 year olds doing the same thing. And you fill those with rebar and some concrete and it becomes a really strong, resilient home. Uh, my colleagues over in Helena and Gallatin Valley, both of those habitats transitioned over to SIPs or self insulating panels. And those go up really lickety split. split. Um, and as a result, those affiliates are doing eight to 10 homes each year because they, they're able to use those particular products. We examined it, we, but we have the best volunteer core in the state. So we've, we've kind of really stuck to stick built all these years. However, I, found, I fell down a rabbit hole about six months ago on 3D concrete printers, also known as additive manufacturing. And I just became enamored with it because, well, by golly, you can, you'll, you'll see in the next slide that you can print a house in 24 hours. And so thinking about like how soon we need housing that's affordable, I got pretty excited about it to say the least. And so what we're doing um, to really kind of suss this concept out, we are partnering up with the University of Montana in two ways. First off, um, there, we have two MBA students who have dedicated some of their time to us to really filtering through the 30 world companies who are working on this technology and trying to make sure that we can find a, um, a printer in the future that can print three stories up because we know land is expensive, but land, but the air is free. And so we wanna make sure we can take advantage of that as time goes by. Uh, and the second collaboration is with the Innovation Factory, where we're gonna um, purchase, co-purchase a, a smaller scale concrete printer uh, with the intent that as we move, we wanna move from concrete, which is not necessarily the most environmentally friendly um, material, but it's extremely durable and resilient, but we want to transition to something that is more environmentally friendly. It's going to take time and research and development to do that. And the Innovation Factory team is the place to do that. So I think it's a great um, collaboration. And I'm going to just show a one minute video. Let's hope it runs here, just so you can see this in action. If you haven't seen it before.
Okay. So pretty cool stuff. I know it seems kind of space agey at times, and that's why I fell down that rabbit hole, but it has potential. And it's something that I feel we have to commend ourselves to, uh, to pursue just to see if it works or it does not for our climate and seismic activity. Uh, next up are lots and laws. We stood up another team, a land acquisition development team. This is very intentionally um, being cross sector. So we have folks from the city, the county, the private sector, and other nonprofit housing partners at the table to really talk about what we can do a little bit differently. One of those partners is um, uh, Trust Montana. You might also be familiar with North Missoula Community Development Corporation. Both entities are working with community land trusts, and this is a way that we can create permanent affordability. And working with them, we can do the construction and they can take over thereafter so that future generations can buy a home that stays re remains affordable for our workforce. So it's a great combination of home ownership along with land stewardship. And when we take those two ideas and we can start to think about what we can do differently from a policy perspective. And so I think, Emily, you mentioned earlier the possibility of ADUs. Well, this is ADUs, but for home ownership. So trying to create some, some tweaks to our zoning code that still allows infill, that gentle infill that Emily so eloquently pointed out, but for home ownership, not just for rentals. And I think this is an opportunity for middle class, that missing middle to really have an opportunity that otherwise, if we will be lost. So we gotta, we gotta move on this. Um, interim rules that we proposed at one point to the mayor and his team were these that you see listed on the screen. We've identified these as being the real key ones that can help reduce the cost of land. And if we can do this near term, um, and then kind of experiment with it as we're as the city is rewriting um, our code over the next three years. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> um, then then we can kind of make sure that we're doing it at the right speed at the right size. All right. And then last but not least, I just really kind of want to show um, just how we can think a little bit differently. We've always done single family housing, but we also know that condos and townhomes take better advantage of very expensive land. And when we do that, we can make them more affordable. They can be more envir environmentally sustainable because they're sharing walls and ceilings. But most importantly, they make them walkable neighborhoods. So instead of building very expensive street infrastructure all through this valley, we can, we can be more resilient and think more creatively and also help to drive down the cost. And I think that is all of my presentation, Nancy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. I'm afraid that your screen got uh, frozen at, at the end of the video, so we didn't oh. have a chance to see the last couple of slides. So um, okay. a few minutes if you want to maybe close it out and open it again sure. and skip over and maybe go in and pick those up. Yep. That might be a, uh, something that we could do here since we're running a little bit ahead of time. That would be possibility. Okay. Uh, so it was after the video you said, right? Yeah, start with the one after the video. Okay. Okay, so here was lots and laws. Community Land Trust. Here's the diagram of our primary residents with instead of just an ADU for rental, but it would be for home ownership. Uh, here are the some ideas for interim rules that could really help that backyard CLT home concept come to fruition. Um, in, in large part, if if we we have to address minimum lot size because that's really the real kicker. Um, a lot of homes today are built on two skinny lots and uh, when combined they can support one but they can't under today's current zoning rules support two and that's really a key element in really making this happen. And then here is the last one just showing a couple of different ideas um, in terms of being able to build up and side by side and making those neighborhoods more walkable. All right. 
Thank you, Heather. I'm glad we got a chance to see some of those visuals at the end, because as you were talking about them, they sounded like they were very interesting. So now we had a chance to see them as well. Thank you very sure, thank much. You. Okay. Oh, well, it's now um, uh, time for our uh, uh, Q&A session. And while we're getting ready for that, let me just remind everyone that if you have any questions for any of our speakers, if you put your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom screen, over probably on toward the right hand side, there's a little thing icon that says Q and A, and that's what you click on to open up a panel where you can type in a question that we can then pass on to our panelists. So let me just remind people to do that. That would be lovely. And um, I just want to reiterate again that both the city and the county are taking public comments right now on their various different draft plans, on the allocation plan and on the um, breaking ground plan and at the end of the of our presentation i'll put up a slide that will give you some more contact information again on how to comment on those so let's move on now to the questions and i have here a couple of questions right off the bat um, let me just go to the first question which i believe is for emily emily could you go back and explain a little bit more detail where the two million dollars in revenue is going to come from from that land sale yeah, it's going to come from the um, sale of the Scott Street parcel, um, and it's estimated at $2 million. It hasn't been finalized yet, so we will know more when it is. Um, and I think the question might also be asking, oh, no, okay. It was just asking what it was, okay. Okay, thank you. So this question is for both Jordan and Emily, is there any potential or benefit of creating a county housing trust fund to join or to merge with the city housing trust fund? Sure, so I can start on that. So there's a, re there's a recommendation in our plan that says explore formation of a city county trust fund. And, you know, and so I think, and we were really you know, we we heard we heard a lot about that um, in many different directions, and I think we were just kind of um, where we landed is that you know that's where we are is is explore because um, it is kind of an open question if we'd want to do that, and it and of course the city city would have to be willing and interested in doing that also. Um, I think you know just as we've started to explore it and Emily I'll just mention too Emily Harris Shears has been on our was on our steering committee for our housing action plan so she gave a lot of really good input on um on many things but especially on on that recommendation um and um the and so you know I think that some of the pros of 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 joining it together is as you saw in Emily's presentation um the the trust funds Okay, yeah. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, so as you saw in, in Emily's presentation, a lot goes into the trust fund, right? It's a, it has a lot of um, admin. So, um, you know, I think one of the pros would be, it, it may not be duplicative, um, but, you know, the, the things we want to really look at are, um, you know, is it, can we work together in a That's satisfactory way? Kind of, I'm on screen. I got to hang up. Um, can we work together in a way that's like really going to satisfy the needs of the city and the county with one with one kind of overarching <laughs> trust fund? Um, do you want to add to that, Emily? Too, Emily. I think that's a great summary of the potential benefits. I think the leveraging opportunity, like Jordan is saying, of um, being able to leverage and partner in that way could be a great opportunity. Um, and then thinking about how we do like jurisdictional funding um, could also be a really great and cool way to collaborate. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the for contemplating what that might look like. Um, Jordan, this is a question for you. What did you mean by right of first refusal? Yeah, that's an easy one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's easier than the trust fund question. Um, but, and I'm sorry, that's a little bit of a jargon term. Um, and I, I should have clarified that better. Um, but, you know, right of first refusal basically means it's, you know, if you, if we were to, um, you know, provide, 
land or something like that to to some entity when they're going to sell it maybe the compliance period on the funding they received is over and um maybe they're looking at selling they uh, uh you know the county or or an agency that we would designate would have the right to they'd have the first option to to buy the property and um so and you know, and maybe they would buy it and may, maybe they wouldn't and it would go to the market, but it just it just kind of makes sure that that uh, a housing, an affordable housing oriented agency would have the chance, um, you know, would have a bite at the apple before um, before it goes on the open market. Thank you, Jordan. Um, so I have a question here for Heather. Um, can you explain again the 400% increase from 30,000 to 150,000 from 2019 to 2021 in the category called laws and something or other on your cost breakdown? Okay, so let's see. Really, it's a 75% increase between 2019 and 2021. Um, it's a $150,000 difference. Um, However, um, oh, I see where he's we're talking about lots and laws. Yeah, so we were literally, we, we worked out a really incredible deal with a set of siblings who donated he, uh, heavily discounted um, lots in East Missoula to us to the tune of $30,000 a piece. But when I get calls today, they're at 150,000. And that, and, and so ultimately it was just some regular long-term Missoulians who have done pretty well thanks to the the housing market who saw that it was their opportunity to give back to this community and the way they did that was with these particular lots in east missoula um, that have um, really have tenants on them right now and we've been tra transitioning them to home ownership over time and um, i hope they won't be the only ones <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just one quick question again, Heather. Does Habitat accept unskilled labor volunteers? Just go all the it. time. All the time. But in, in, in all honesty, people are always skilled in some capacity. So if they're unskilled in construction, we will teach them on the job site. Um, but we also have people who um, bring their strengths to the table all the time on our various different committees. So it might be on the land acquisition team or our philanthropy committee or something along those lines that um, we leverage all the time. Just reach out and let me know what your strengths are and we'll put you to work. Okay. <laughs> um, Emily, what's the smallest allow allowable lot size in the city of Missoula? Do you know? Oh boy. <laughs> Heather, do you know? I do. <laughs> it's uh, 2,700 square feet. Okay. And that's typically found in the Franklin to the Fort neighborhood or on the north side, west side. Okay. Thanks, Heather. You bet. And just one other quick question for Heather. Um, do you do multifamily homes at all, like duplexes or fourplexes? Or We're moving in that direction. Um, and in large part because we know that single family is very expensive and we're we're really trying to um i guess color outside of the lines and duplexes and triplexes for home ownership um essentially are townhomes and across the state of montana um there are places in the butte area that have been doing this for years and and i look forward to being able to offer that as a housing type in the not too distant future Okay, thank you. Emily, are there any plans for doing any community fundraising for the trust fund? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that is something that I'm looking into and researching right now and thinking about um, what are our opportunities to both do community education through maybe a fundraising strategy about the fact that we even have a trust fund and um, how we can use it and all these, I think opportunities like this are great, but um, we're not always reaching everyone. So are there ways to do community events and things like that where we do education about the affordable housing trust fund and then also potentially some fundraising strategies. We're also looking into opting in strategies where people when they sell homes could potentially opt into providing a portion of their sale and things like that, like a voluntary real estate transfer 
um, tax. And we're just doing a lot of research right now on the long-term revenue strategies um, and thinking about what the benefits and potential drawbacks of those are, but absolutely. Um, and then we will um, continue to explore what it would look like to like really motivate and ask donors um, who like to be contributors to the trust fund and what that looks like and how. Um, and that's something that we're working on. So great questions. Thank you, Emily. Um, so Jordan, this one's for you. Uh, are you thinking already about the 2023 legislature and what kinds of uh, statewide policy laws and things that we might be able to? Work? I lost all the Q&A. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Sorry, we've got a couple people who are trying to help with questions and they keep on, they, they need to remember to keep their mics muted. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, Jordan, to you. Um. Yeah, so on the 2023 session, I, I think we're definitely thinking about it. And um, but you know, we're just starting and we'll we'll have to see what the composition of the legislature is. And um, but yeah, I mean I think it's really critical and we I mean we really need to work together and engage partners around the state to um, you know to make sure that the the legislature is hopefully hopefully, you know, like better um, responding to our needs um, for affordable housing. So um, yeah, I don't know much right now about particular bills or anything like that, or, you know, we, we obviously don't even know who's going to be in the legislature yet, but we're definitely have our eye on it and we're starting to think about it. Nancy, could I respond to that question too? Sure. Um, so one of, one of the great opportunities I had for two years was to serve on the Montana League of Cities and Towns. So essentially this is other electeds, um, whether mayor or uh, city council or treasurer, um, basically having an opportunity to hear one another. And um, the benefit of that, along with Habitat, is that we have affiliates throughout the larger communities in the state. And so the advocacy work that, uh, that we are doing here at Habitat in Missoula has a ripple effect. So my colleagues see what we're working on, I learn what they're doing, and when we start to cut, cut and paste, and we then take it to that next level in our local environments. But the, I think the other key thing to remember is Missoula is a blue city in a red state. And why I bring that up is that we have to also make sure that how we approach um, our, our Republican leaders is not with an at an arm's length. We have to figure out how we actually engage with them and include them at the table. And to that end, um, the philanthropy committee that I that I put together, I asked Jesse Ramos to chair that committee. And, and, and it was entirely based on embracing the entire universe because um, it's gonna take all of us to solve it. And I think when we, when we think about how we engage at the state level, it, it requires us being open-minded and open-hearted to those who think differently from ourselves. Thank you, Heather. Um, uh, that's something that the league would be interested in helping with also, by the way, when we go to the state legislature with proposals for what's going to be done. Great. Um, so uh, sounds like some of our current zoning laws are barriers to building affordable housing. housing. Um, is the city or the county looking at modifying those? And I'll give this to Emily first. Thanks. Um, yes, they are. So the uh, community planning uh, division of community planning development and innovation, which is the department that I work in, um, is taking on a comprehensive review of the city code and zoning. Um, it was a budget item in the fiscal year 2022 budget. Um, and I think Heather said in her presentation that it is a multi-year process. And so, um, you know, I think thinking through what are some of those potential things to do in the interim and things like that. Um, they did a Title 20 code review recently, um, and now they're doing a more comprehensive overhaul as well. So um, those are what's going on in the city around code and zoning. Heather, do you want to add anything? Um, you know, I would just add that 
I know the county's process has taken the better part of three years. And the odds are the city's process will be pretty much one and the same. And that requires a lot of public pro um, involvement process um, to try and get it all finessed right. And, and perfection is in the, re in the reality of things. Uh, let, me, let me back up just a second. When I got to council, I had a vision of building perfect neighborhoods. And the reality is, is that perfection is really, really pricey. And so when we think of a continuum or a spectrum of perfection on one end, on the opposite end is practicality. And I, and I fully admit I have, learned, I have leaned more towards the practical side so that we can bring on more supply, less perfection because housing has gotten so expensive. And so I think if we can, if we can look at the low hanging fruit in this, pro, in this process of picking out some of those key elements in zoning, uh, like minimum lot size and reducing it, I think that could really help us experiment in the next couple of years as we continue on the path of rewriting our zoning code. And Jordan, would you like to comment on that question for the county? Yeah, so the so as Heather mentioned, um, Missoula County is working on a zoning code update, um, and the and I would encourage everybody to you know check that out and um, participate in that process, and that is um, really focused on the area on the outskirts of the city of Missoula, and um, the and you know, the plan talks a lot about um, about zoning and um, the need to zone the whole county. A lot of the a lot of lands in Missoula County have no zoning. Um, and, you know, the need we need to, you know, create that predictability and encourage development where we want to see it and um, preserve what we want to preserve. So, um, the, you know, there's quite a bit about that in especially that kind of goal one section of the recommendations. And then um, our current zoning code update has some housing incentives. And then, I mean, that's something we need to keep doing going forward is providing incentives to encourage people um, to um, develop affordable properties. Okay, thank you, Jordan. So I have a question, couple questions here for Heather. Um, Heather, if you could speak briefly to these, cause we're gonna run, we're kind of running out of time. First one is a question about financing. What are the constraints and availability of financing for people in partnerships that are doing smaller projects, like in the two to eight range? Just yeah, um, finance stacking is, is difficult at best. Um, it requires a lot of working relationships with various different banks in town. And I know a number of them have not gotten to actually pull permits. Um, we tend to have really great relationships um, with our banks. And all I can say is just keep at it and if you have a if you hear a no find another banker they, they are out there and they will say yes okay thank you so i have a question uh, for the city either one of you can take this one um for the fourth and ronald condo project that emily mentioned why did the city require only 20 percent affordable units to be affordable at 120 percent ami um, why didn't the city do a better job of driving a better bargain in exchange for giving up the public right of way? Who would like to take that? Well, I wasn't here, so I don't have oh. the historical context of it. So Heather, would you start? Yeah, you know, it, you know, it, it's a it's a really fair question, and I don't know if I'm gonna give you the answer you're looking for, but. Um, the reality is the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is specifically targeted at 120% and below in a AMI. And the rationale behind that is that Habitat, Homeward, North Missoula CDC, Housing Authority, we all focus on 40 to 80% of AMI. And that missing part is 80 to 120% of AMI. So the trust fund intentionally wanted to make sure that they included that segment of our population that doesn't otherwise have access to federal subsidy, but still is being priced out of the market. So it's, it, it's what they could make pencil on this particular project and meet the goals of the trust fund. Okay, Jordan, did you wanna to add to that? 
Yeah, I was just gonna add, I think, thank you, Heather. And um, that was very well said. And I, I just, it's been interesting to me as I have um, been collecting public feedback on, um, on our housing action plan. And I just see a lot of, I do see a lot of public feedback. We had a lot of comments in there about how there aren't enough programs for people who are at, um, you know, just above 80% AMI. And I think um, that's especially important with home ownership programs because um, the, I think what a lot of these programs have found is that it's, it's really difficult to, you always have to kind of find this Goldilocks person who, is going to, their income is gonna be low enough to meet the limit, but they're gonna to have to be bankable. They're gonna to have, have to have like the correct debt to income ratio to be able to actually purchase the, the unit. So um, it's just, it's a real balancing act. And, and, and I think that we're, I think we're actually gonna see more, especially as with projects we can locally control, I think we're going to see more projects that are aimed at people with, with you know, up to 120 or up to 125 percent AMI for that reason. And Emily, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to add that I think part of the question is also why only 20 percent of the units. Um, and as I said, I wasn't here, so I wasn't a part of brokering this deal, but I also know um, that through the exploration of the incentives program that we're doing, the voluntary incentives program that we're doing right now, um, I think you know Heather has done a great job of highlighting how expensive it is to build. And so there's that sweet spot of how to get the units um, to pencil and still get affordability in the in the project and we do um, have to balance some of that and I'll just share that in our incentive exploration like our consultants are really pushing us into like the 15% range of affordable units because of that penciling factor and so that's just something too to be aware of and I also just want to say that this fourth and the Reed and the row project on fourth and Ronald um, was also the first time that the city brokered a deal like this. Um, and it was before we had the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. It was before we had a lot of those structures in place. And so we've learned a lot from that partnership and we've learned a lot um, from doing that. But um, I, I can't speak to why they didn't go for more or things like that, but just wanted to offer maybe some helpful context to how they got there, fully acknowledging that I wasn't here yet. So I can't speak for them, but I, I'm assuming that that was some of the mindset. Thank you, Emily. So I have a question here. Are there other Montana cities that are experiencing the same level of lot and inflation as Missoula? And which ones are they? And what kind of inflation are they seeing? I'd like to take that. It are is there? everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Um, even in Ravalli County, my colleagues down there can't find land that is affordable in Hamilton. They have to go as far away as Darby to find the lots that they can afford um, for their families. Same thing on the east side of the state. Billings is being hit with it. St. Regis of all places. I mean, everywhere has a housing crisis and um, it, it's going to require just rethinking how we're going to tackle it and uh, getting people involved that haven't been involved in the past. What, and I, th what, I think, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Oh, and I think one thing that, you know, I think it's like, it can be so puzzling to us because we think, oh, Montana, there's so, this is like, Missoula County is huge, Montana is enormous, like, there's so much land, but we are kind of constrained by, you know, we do have a lot of places that aren't suitable to build. We have a lot of, um, you know, really steep places. We have places that aren't safe because of flooding and wildfires, but we're also really constrained by infrastructure too. And I mean, and that's another piece of the puzzle is we have to like build, you know, increase the footprint of our infrastructure and use it efficiently to improve our housing supply. And could you could you break down what that infrastructure is for those of us who are not that familiar with the term? Yeah, so I think the ones we struggle with the most, and Heather could I think speak to this probably a lot more than I could. Is like um, is water and sewer are the ones that really limit us. Um, and and yep. I don't know. Do you want to add anything? About oh yeah. That? 
So every every now and again, I have someone say, well, why build in? Why do we do infill? Because there's a whole bunch of land on the outside of Missoula. It's plenty of land. Well, yes, there's we have lots of land, but we don't have enough lots and lots are, are I mean, take a long time to develop. And it's not just water and, and sewer. It's also stormwater and streets, streets roughly cost half a million dollars for every block that we build. So that's spendy. Hence the reason why infill makes a heck of a lot more sense because that infrastructure is already there and it helps to drive down the cost. Thank you. So I have another uh, in, infill question of sorts. Along with the city zoning, um, can one of the panelists speak to the potential of going back to the historical single room occupancy apartments? This seems especially important in light of the demographic notes that you mentioned earlier about how the uh, house, household sizes are changing. Mm -hmm. um, either one of you want to take that before I do? Okay, go Jordan. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think that's something that we're working on, like addressing in our zoning code update is that's, you know, just Heather has mentioned a lot of those really important um, housing types that are sort of that missing middle of, um, you know, we need ADUs and multifamily properties and things like that. And and that's another housing type. And, um, you know, when we rehearsed some of the questions, we talked about some of these, you know, particular demographics like um, students um, and um, older adults. And those are those are groups that can really especially benefit from from that housing type of, of maybe a unit, you know, where you have your own um, bedroom and bathroom, but you, you you have a common kitchen. Um, and so, those, you know, I think those are things that we just need to really look at allowing to to help meet the needs of our of people in our community. Emily, did you want to comment on that? Uh, no, I agree. And I'll, for time, I'll just say that. <laughs> okay. Right. So I, I have one last question, and this one is Emily is for you. Do you know if the city is exploring the possibility of implementing linkage fees for fund additions to the Housing Trust Fund? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, our uh, legal opinion that we received about linkage fees is that from the state legislature, they're not allowed. Um, and so we're, it's not something that we can explore. Okay. And I did miss one further back. Heather, can you just speak briefly about the outreach potential to homeowners that Habitat uses? Sure. Um, and every year we have a, an application process. Um, due to circumstances this year, we're not going to do it this year, but we'll start it up again next year. But it's um, it's a way that we create a pipeline for our future homeowners um, that I think is just really key to make sure that making sure that we can talk to people, get them prepped and follow along that um, pathway to home ownership. But it also requires us tipping over our silos of excellence in the nonprofit world and building a better housing pipeline. So what I mean by that is for example, Homeward does a tremendous job with their financial fitness classes and renter wise classes. And for our homeowners, we make sure that they take their home ownership class so that they aren't surprised along the process. Um, additionally, working with our, our partners at N NMCDC or Trust Montana, working with that, um, working with the land trust side of things, um, that's what we're working on trying to make sure that we can do the right outreach. Um, and then I would also say that if anybody is interested in partnering with Habitat along that idea of the backyard CLT home concept, reach out to me because what we got to make sure is that both the city and the county know, which they do, but <laughs> let them know like this is something that Missoulians really actually can can see themselves being a part of the solution. But if you can let us know that you're interested, that goes a long ways to making it happen. All right, thank you. So I have just one, I keep saying one last question. This really is the last question. It's a question I'd like all three of you to answer and we'll go in the order in which you presented. We'll start with Emily, go to Jordan and go to Heather. And the, the question before we get started on it, the question is um, just pr pr beyond providing comments and input, what can Missoula residents do to help the situation? 
And uh, before we start answering it, I'm going to put up a slide that has the contact information for everyone. So just bear with me for a moment. And then we'll go to, okay, we will go to Emily first in answering that question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I can't underscore how important it is to provide public comment and to provide input. Um, we use it, we really do. So um, I wanna just really underscore that when we asked for feedback on the policies and procedures for the trust fund, I kept a 400 person or whatever it was spreadsheet of everything. It wasn't 400, it was like 80, but it was a lot of feedback of everybody's points in the whole 50 page document. And then I responded and all those pieces. So we do use it and I can't underscore that. And um, the other way, I would say for the city and for the trust fund is to let me know that you're interested in working on projects or subcommittees or things like that. I keep a list of engaged and interested community partners. Um, you know, when we were seating the oversight committee, we used a work group um, to create the materials and things like that. We have opportunities like that. I'm always trying to think of ways to engage. And then if you have interest in ever participating in the oversight committee, I would say to look for vacancies and consider applying and being a part of that. And there will continue to be um, more opportunities as we have new projects and new pieces of the trust fund and the housing policy that come on. So I would say if you're not getting city uh, emails and emails from our department, sign up for those, participate in Engage Missoula, um, and those are ways that you'll be notified about opportunities. Um, but definitely, if you'd like to reach out and we can have a chat about what partnership might look like, and that might even mean that I send you to an organization that I know is looking for partners, but um, if we don't have an active project. Okay, thank you. Jordan, what can people do, residents do beyond just commenting on plans? Um. Yeah, great question. And I would echo Emily that the, you know, um, commenting is super important because, you know, you, you know, you're the expert on your life and your family and your neighborhood. Um, but I, I would say, you know, just balance that with, I think that um, it's also really important that we keep open minds and listen to each other. Um, the, you know, this, we really need to increase our supply of housing and um, we're going to sometimes um, have some opportunities and things come up that are going to have some trade-offs. So, um, you know, please do share your input, but um, also I, I would say, you know, listen and keep an open mind to the input of others and, um, you know, including experts, elected officials and other members of the public too. Thank you, Jordan. Heather. Well, three words come to mind. Build back better. We are in the building in business and uh, as a nonprofit, in order for us to escalate the, and accelerate the number of homes we wanna build from two to building a lot more than that, it's gonna require a lot of folks doing things a little bit differently. So if you have financial resources, give them. If you have time resources, give those. Uh, the question earlier was, do you have to be skilled to be on the job site? The answer is no. If you are part of an organization in any capacity, I don't care if it's a service club, uh, a church, a business organization, an association, one of the best things that you can do is come join us on the build site. And it's a great way to build camaraderie as well as a commitment to the work that we all need to do. Um, and I'd say just build back better. Thank you, Heather. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Emily Harris Shears, Affordable Housing Trust Fund Administrator, City of Missoula. Thank you, Jordan Lyons, Housing Specialist, Missoula County. Thank you, Heather Harp, Executive Director for Habitat for Humanity. This has been an amazing discussion this evening. Thank you so much. And thank you to Habitat for co-sponsoring with the League of Women Voters. And thank you to all those who attended. We had 42 people on the call at, on this webinar and uh, 42 folks who now can go out and become ambassadors for affordable housing and helping to solve this problem for Missoula. 
We will be uh, posting a recording of this webinar on the League of Women Vo Voters Missoula webpage. Um, and we'll probably be sending out a link to that at some point so you can find it. So um, thank you all for this evening. Um, and uh, that concludes our webinar and a good evening to you all. Thank you. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.